wouldn't it uh, wouldn't it be nice if the world was a nicer place? That you just turned on the news and all the reports were good about how uh, people are getting along, people are helping one another out, countries are getting along and helping one country helping the other countries out and vice versa. Wouldn't it be nice if people just uh, smiled more? If when you heard people laughing, when you hear people laughing and you're at school or at the workplace, you knew that they weren't laughing harshly. They weren't laughing at somebody. You knew that somebody wasn't the butt of that joke. But you hear laughter and you just automatically uh, assume that they're just sharing joy together. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, why can't it be that way? Uh, Wouldn't it be nice if people were quick to comfort and slow to lecture? Wouldn't it be nice if when we sinned or, or blew it in some way or just simply embarrassed ourselves, you know, you bend over and your pants rip out or something, wouldn't it be nice if we could count on the people around us not to gossip about that? Like you're, you're with your friends, you're with your family at church, and you know they're not going to be running around saying, did you see what happened to Pastor's pants when he bent over, you know? Wouldn't it be nice if, if, if we just knew the people around us, they're not going to gossip, they're not going to share my embarrassment, my sorrow, my weakness? Wouldn't it be wonderful if all of us stopped being so blasted critical? Last week, a number of people appreciated the, the message, and uh, I just want to, I've said this many times, but i preaching to myself. I know what it means to be a critical person. So ungodly, so self-righteous, so hypocritical. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, if my impulse was to be encouraging instead of being critical? To be more like God and less like hell. That when I go someplace, I bring the joy of the Lord with me and not the sulfur scent of hell. Wouldn't it be nice if as a church family, we just started blessing and building each other up more and more? Wouldn't it be great if we could just leave our doors unlocked and all our valuables just sitting around because we knew that nobody is going to grab stuff that don't belong to them. Not because they're afraid that somebody's going to catch them, but because everyone loves God. I love God. And everybody loves each other. And so I don't want to take stuff that's not mine. I wouldn't even, wouldn't even dream of taking stuff that's not mine. Wouldn't it be just like a taste of heaven? I mean, it'd be great if our culture was like that, but what if just our church was like that? Not, not just ours, but Christian churches. You go to church and people have your back. The people in front of you and behind you and next to you have your best interests at heart. They're not there to criticize the color of the carpet, not there to criticize the, the drum player or pastor's tie. You know how you never get criticized about your tie? Don't wear them. Can I hear an amen? (laughs) It'd be like a taste of heaven. A taste of heaven. If we could come to church and our hearts were overwhelmed with affection for one another. Oh, it's so good to see you. What, has it been a week? Oh, I saw you on Thursday Neighborhood. That's right. Seems like a long time. So good to see you. Because every time I see you, I'm encouraged. Every time we get together, I love it. Overwhelmed with affection for one another. Right now, in your heart, say, God, go ahead. God, give me more love 
for my brothers and sisters in our church. Now, we can pray for more love for the world, and we should. More love for brothers and sisters all, in every church everywhere, and we should. But right now, just say, God, just this little family right here, help me to love them more. It'd be like a taste of paradise. If we just wanted to strengthen each other, my goal is to bring encouragement, to give you courage, bring peace, bring a, a bit of joy, give you a reason to rejoice, give you a reason to be thankful today. And, and your heart was the same for the person next to you and behind you and in front of you, you know, all over in this congregation right now. It'd be like just a little bit of a taste of, of heaven, of eternity, if we'd say, I'm not going to hold on to a grudge because that is nasty. <laughs> I'm going to let go of my grudges. I, I, I got this against that person. I've got this against that person. And they said this to me, you know, five years ago. And it's just, oh, come off it. <laughs> and evil, evil memories. The thing about evil memories is they are wicked. They're evil. Do not hold on to evil memories. And together, uh, we just start loving this Bible, and we start loving our Lord, loving to pray, loving to see people serve, loving the kids that God's blessed our church with. And together, we start loving the business of the Great Commission. We're going to reach out, share the love of God, and bring more people close to Jesus together in love that would be that would be paradise or or the best we can get this side of heaven that'd be wonderful let's uh, turn in our bibles to ephesians chapter 4 ephesians chapter 4 25 to the end of the chapter, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. Therefore, church, <clears throat> each of you has to put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor for all members of one body. In other words, stop lying, start being decept stop being de stop lying, stop being deceptive, stop putting on a, a mask and a false face because we're all members of of one body, it's like the church is this one body, we're supposed to function in that kind of unity. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. <clears throat> well, verse 27 tells us the devil wants to get a foothold in your family. The devil wants to get a foothold in your friendships. The devil wants to get a foothold in your life. The devil wants to get a foothold in our church. So he's going to be looking for people then who are holding on to their anger, who are being deceptive. And he's going to use that like a crowbar to pry apart the church. That's what he does. He's bad. Those who have been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands so that they can share with others who are in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. When I read this, we should all realize that we've been guilty at one point or another of saying something that really wasn't edifying. The Bible says don't let any of that garbage come out of your mouth. In God's family, he doesn't want his children talking like that. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only, what, what am I going to say? Only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That's kind of a limiting, because I feel like I want to vent. Well, like we saw last week, God's will, my will. And when I start vomiting all over people and venting, 
That's exalting myself above the Lord. It's, it's pride. It's darkness. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed by the day of redemption. In the context, this is Christians getting along with one another, Christians being united. And when Christians are not getting along with one another, when we're, when we're treating each other poorly, tearing each other down, gossiping about each other, complaining, holding on to grudges, all these things, the Bible says we actually grieve the Holy Spirit. We bring sadness to the Spirit of God. Well, that's my spiritual gift. Well, what? <laughs> bring sadness to the Spirit of God? Get rid of all bitterness, Dan. You could probably put your own name in there when you read it. That'd be okay. Get rid of all bitterness, Dan. Rage and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. If we only remember verse 32 from Ephesians chapter 4 today, that's going to revolutionize our lives. Hey! Hey! Be kind! Be compassionate. Forgive one another. I should forgive the people around me because God has forgiven me. In the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Christ is teaching his people how they should act and talk and even think. Who does he think he is? God? God is concerned how you act. God is concerned how you speak. And God is even so, he's so oppressive. He's even concerned how you think. And you know what? As parents, we get that. We want our kids to act right. But it's not enough for them just to do the right thing and, and talk nasty. We want them to speak correctly. And you know what? It's not enough for them just to comply on the outside. We really want them to be good on the inside. We're so oppressive that way. Well, God's the same. God says, I want your actions to be right. I want the way you talk to one another to be right. And, and I'm concerned about what's going on inside that head of yours. God wants us to get that straight as well. Again, who does he think he is? Well, he's, he's God. He, he has that right. He, know, he made us. He knows what's best for us. God really does believe that he knows what's best for us better than ourselves. God really does believe that, that this word right here can tell us about ourselves and, and tell us what we should do better than we know ourselves. The Sermon on the Mount starts off very boldly with the Beatitudes. And remember, we said these are the attitudes that should be. Blessed are happy, or happy, are, who, are those who understand that they're spiritually bankrupt. They're, they're, they have this bankruptness. And my spell checker didn't understand that word. Uh, blessed and ha are happy are those who understand how bankrupt they are spiritually uh, because... The Bible says the kingdom of heaven belongs to a person like that. I'm utterly lost without the Lord. I've got this darkness in my heart. I've got these spiritual struggles. I see God's way and I say, you know what, that looks good. I want to be a kind and loving person. And what's the next thing? I erupt at my kids or my wife because don't you know I'm trying to be spiritual right now? Isn't that silly? You just knocked me off stride. That's all your fault. The devil's saying, you, yeah, you're good. I like that. <laughs> Blessed or happy are those who understand their spiritual bankrupt, bankruptivity. <clears throat> Christ goes on to deliver just this amazing broadside 
just hammering the notion of human self-righteousness. He then describes how people who follow him, if you say you follow Jesus, you're supposed to be different. We're called to be different. We're supposed to be hungry for goodness. Have you ever felt that in your heart? Listen, have you ever felt in your heart, I'm hungry for goodness. I see it. I, I, I can hear this music coming from heaven. I want to dance to that tune. Everything about God seems so good compared to everything that's in here. And I thirst for that. I long for that. Lord God, I want to care about goodness. Have you ever been like that? We're called to be good forgivers. You know that doesn't necessarily come easy. Different people also struggle with different sins. I mean, we, we, all, we're all, we all struggle with sin, right? But some of us, forgiveness is really, really hard. And you wonder, what's let it go, let it go. And it's so hard for me, I can't let it go. Because I've been devalued. I've been underappreciated. I've been treated miserably. I've been overlooked. So how's that bitterness working for you? Uh, it ain't? Okay. But it's still hard. Sin is hard to deal with. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in church. We need to be in Bible study. We need our brothers and sisters. That's why we need this whole Christian walk. Because there should be no lone rangers in Christianity. No lone rangers. Brothers and sisters, this morning... If you have somebody you really need to forgive, start working on that. I mean, seriously. Pray and say, God, I know this is hellacious. Help me to forgive. God, I want my life to bring glory to you by the way I live. <clears throat> have you ever thought about, what does that mean, bring glory? That's another one of those words that sometimes I worry, it's, it's just too religious, right? I want to bring glory to. Uh, think about your life. When people see you in your neighborhood, when people see you at, at work, when, you're, when your family, especially maybe the family who knew you before you got saved, are you bringing the love of Jesus wherever you go? When, when people see your life, do you say, you know, that, that's a pretty nice person. Well, they go to church. Oh, they do. Or do people say, oh, man, they call themselves a Christian and talk like that? They call themselves a Christian and act like that? That's the opposite of bringing glory. That's bringing shame on the name of Jesus Christ. So is it your mission, your purpose? Say, God, I want to glorify your name. When people see me, I hope they see Jesus. And I want people to be, to be hungry for heaven. I want people to think about the cross. Because of the way I'm choosing to follow Christ in my life. So, so we want to be good, good, good forgivers. And we want to let go of this, all this bitterness and, and rancor and all these grudges and we want to be people who are quick to confess our weakness and our need and our, our dependency on the Lord. That's the Lord's prayer says, your will be done, not my will, and, and I need you, God. Then last week, like we said, we saw this Lord's prayer. Prayer. That's kind of a tricky subject. You know, you become a Christian, and if you didn't grow up in the church, What's prayer? Is it like an incantation? Is, is it something, maybe if I, I write it down five times, it, God will happen? Or if I only have enough faith and it's, you know, uh, if, if I could just get a, ooh, ooh, enough faith feeling, then, then I can get what I want. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if you could just say, Jesus, come on, just show me, teach me how to pray. Well, that would be cool, and God is so cool, he said, yeah, I got that covered. And so we wish we could ask Jesus how to pray, and right in the Bible, Jesus says, okay, guys, here's how you pray. I like that, because that's a question we would have, and God already got it covered. So last week we saw in the Lord's Prayer, 
uh, Jesus himself is telling you, uh, we're in, you're in luck because here's how you're going to pray. And Jesus taught us that we need to pray, God, your will be done. Your kingdom come. God, it's about your will. It's, it's not about what I want. It's not, about all, it's not about all my needs and all my desires. God, it's about what you want. And Lord God, I want to see your kingdom established right here in Janesville, Wisconsin. Lord God, we want to see your kingdom, your righteousness established in our family, in, in my life. And we're also supposed to pray, looking forward to the future, uh, for that ultimate fulfillment at the second coming. And God says, when you, hear, you want to know how to pray? Well, pray this way. Look forward right there in the Lord's Prayer uh, for your kingdom to come and be established here on earth. Uh, and we saw how comforting it is. Lord God, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. Lord God, I'm worried. Oh, I, I'm so afraid of, of the test results. Or I'm so afraid of I'm going to pay my bills next week. I'm so all these different fears, all these different worries. And we saw how comforting it is. Right in the Lord's Prayer, we're supposed to be utterly reliant on God for our daily bread. And that's the only reason I can get up here and preach. God, I don't feel worthy. I don't feel like I can accomplish. God, what? Okay, I remember. I'm supposed to rely on you. You ever forget that sometimes? Start relying on yourself. It's such a liberating thing to know, oh, I can rely on my heavenly father, my dad in heaven. And we saw this can be actual food. In, in America, we have so much abundance in America. We have so much, I mean, you open your refrigerator and there's usually stuff in there. Not always at the end of the month, but for the most part. In, in, uh, but there are times and places where people have to say, Lord God, this morning, I don't know how I'm going to feed the family today. And we come to God in faith and, and utter reliance. And we saw that even more than actual food, though, and, and more importantly, we see that we rely on God for our spiritual nourishment daily. Well, I, got, I did that Christian thing last month. I should be good. doesn't work like that. Oh, Lord God, I'm, I'm trying so hard, I'm trying so hard, I'm trying so Are you trusting me for your spiritual bread today? We say, oh, that's good, because I'm not finding the hope in here. But I am finding the hope up there. You know, it's all very practical and straightforward. The entire sermon uh, on the Mount, including the Lord's Prayer, is, is about application. How does God want us to live? That's, that's another big question. Oh, what does God want me to do? Jesus says, got you covered. <laughs> Sermon on the Mount. Again, I think God's pretty cool. How does God want me to act, talk, think? Sermon on the Mount. Today we're going to look at the kind of behavior that God loves to bless. Well, I want God to bless me. What should I do? God says, got you covered. <laughs> How can we live a life that God is pleased with? That God says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless a life like that. As I read, I want you to keep in mind that God loves you. God loves you very, very much. He loves you so much that he would come to earth, be beaten, be spit upon, be rejected, be hammered to a cross, have all of the filth and crud and nastiness of our lives dumped on him on the cross, that's how much he loves us. And he rose again to say, I'm going to take care of you, my sweetheart, my beloved. I'm going to take you away from this. I'm going to give you paradise. Everything is going to be okay. And I'm going to wipe every tear from your eyes. Kind of sounds romantic, doesn't it? That's the kind of love we see for, in the Bible for God, for his church. In fact, God says, I'm going to marry you. And Jesus is called the, the groom, and the church is actually literally called the bride of Christ. It is romantic. 
And we've got a hero who's looking out for us. God loves us. God loves you. And that's why he says, now here's the way I want you to live. God loves his people. He wants your heart. Well, I, I go to church. I toss some money in the offering plate. I try to do the right thing. Isn't that enough? God wants your heart. It's like a married couple. And the man comes home and, and, and his wife wants to connect with them. He says, what? I'm home. Isn't that enough? Or, or, or a hu husband is just... He's, he's feeling lonely, and he needs his wife. And she says, what? I cook dinner. And, and God says, I want your heart. And we say, what? I'm at church. He said, no, I want you to love me because I love you. I'm crazy about you. God wants your heart. God wants to share life with you. That's that whole thing we saw right in Genesis where Jesus was going to come, uh, God incarnate, come and walk in the garden in the cool of the day with Adam. That means life together. Let's walk life together. We see that throughout the entire scriptures. God says, do life with me. He says, I'm not going to throw it. Let me in and, and we'll eat together. God says, let's do life together. It's all about love. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to look at 16 through 24. When you fast, uh, fasting is, is when you're not eating uh, specifically. So we say break fast in the morning, but that's really not fasting, break fast or breakfast. Uh, because usually we're just not eating because we're asleep. But... But uh, when we're not eating for the purpose of focusing on God. So I was fasting the other day because I was really involved in this heated video game and I didn't want to take time. No, that's not fasting. That's just skipping a meal. But when we skip a meal so that we can spend time in prayer and, and maybe take a prayer walk or just read our Bibles, when, when, we're, when we're missing a meal or, or a few days of meals because we want to focus on the Lord, that's what fasting is about. And Jesus says, okay, Okay, kids, uh, okay, uh, my beloved, uh, when you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show you that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've already received all the reward they're going to get. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that you will not be obvious to others that you're fasting but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Uh, let's extrapolate a little bit. He's saying when you do religious things, don't do it to build yourself up. When you do religious things, when you're caring for somebody, when you're going out of your way, when, you, when, when, you're, when you're learning about forgiveness and you're learning patience, when you're taking care of somebody who's down on their luck, when you're doing all these things, don't do it so that other people will think, Look at how spiritual they are. Look at how wonderful they are. Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. Do it in secret. Don't tell how everybody how, how much you're suffering or how much you're sacrificing. It, it, do it in secret, and, and I'm going to reward that. And God would love it if everybody in his church was doing awesome, wonderful things all the time, and we weren't always talking about it to show each other how spiritual we are. God says, boy, that would be a great that would be a great, Jesus' people act like that. That's wonderful. All doing good things. Doing good without uh, drawing attention to ourselves. Jesus goes right on from there because this idea of, of doing something that's good in order for the Lord to reward us, instead of doing what's good to get all sorts of accolades or get, uh, get attention for ourselves in this world, he says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. So this is not just financial. In context, we're seeing don't just do things in order to build yourself up. Where moth and rust can destroy, where thieves break in and steal. And, and there's the old truism that the more you have, the more you worry about losing. 
But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. What does that mean, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven? Have you thought about that? God, I want to store up treasures in heaven. I want to value the things that you value. I want to value the things of heaven. Verse 21. Sisters, brothers, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And God wants your heart. So that's why he wants your treasures with him. The things that you value should be the things that God values because he wants your heart. He doesn't want just the check in the offering plate. He wants your heart. So where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. The things that are most meaningful to me are what? What's most meaningful to you? And if it's not the things of God, then he doesn't have our heart as much as he wants to have it. Everybody tracking? What's the most important things in my life? Because Jesus says, where your treasure is, what you treasure, that's where your heart is going to be. The lamp, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Nobody can serve two masters. Either will hate the one and love the other, or will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't serve both. So what am I living my life for? I, I was... Uh, I've been a lot, uh, well, I noticed, uh, I, how should I say this? Uh, I often get up here and confess weaknesses and sin. We were talking about that on uh, Wednesday night, and the reason I do that is, is uh, for one, because it's good for me. I mean, I've got to. I, I can't come up here and pretend uh, like I've got my life all together and then preach the word because that would be, basing it all on lie. So I, I want to show how God's forgiveness and grace works in my life. But also, I think that when we're spiritually mature, we're good confessors. And so I want to build up a church of people who are confessing our weakness in, a, in the times, like, I need grace. And that helps other people. If we're all pretending to be up here, then nobody feels safe to confess their sins, and we kind of nullify the cross. And so we need to be open. And, and one of the things that sometimes happens to me is you get afraid of uh, when you're preaching or when you're counseling, you get afraid of, of contradicting people. And, and I don't want to do that. And I, I do it, but I don't want to do it. And Christ says, what are you valuing more, money or me? Money or me? Let's be putting God first every time, every, every single time. Go back to uh, verses 22 and 23, and I just learned this this week. It's kind of a neat thing. I was reading this book by a Jewish Christian theologian named David Stern, and he, he notes that uh, it seems like Jesus is actually quoting part of a Jewish proverb here. And, he, and Jesus says, uh, Ayin tova, which means uh, the good eye, and the idea is a good eye is, equals generosity. And he says, ayin ra'a, which means the bad eye is, is greedy. And this makes sense in context. Right before, we're talking about not storing up your wealth on earth because God wants our hearts. And right after, we see that God, uh, we can't serve God and money too. And in, in your eye, if your eye is full of darkness, in other words, greed, your whole body is full of darkness. If your eye is full of generosity, and, and don't just think in terms of money. That's too simple. It's too simple to be spiritual by saying, I put money in an offering plate. That doesn't count. Christ is telling us that if our eyes are filled with generosity towards others, then our whole being on a soul level, a soul level is filled with light. I need some light in my life. It's too heavy. It's too oppressive. 
Well, is your eye full of generosity when you're looking at other people? Am I generous towards them when they show their faults, when they show their nasty side? Because if our eye is, is greedy, if it's, if it's not generous, our whole body, our soul gets dark and oppressive. If we're not satisfied with the things we have, if we're not satisfied with the, other, the way other people treat us or the way other people act, there's going to be this darkness in our hearts. Always wanting more, demanding more of others. It's going to be darkness through and through, Christ says. Do we think only about only what we can get or do for ourselves or, or what other people can do for us? Or do we look at ways to be generous with others? And again, not just money, but generous with patience. I want to be generous with patience. You're looking at a person who struggles with that. I want to be generous with forgiveness. I'm actually a pretty good forgiver. If I'm going to confess some things, I'm, you know, everybody struggles with different sins. Uh, that doesn't mean it always comes easy. There's been times where I've been shocked and said, wow, I've got to really pray about this because I'm not forgiving the way I normally do. But I'm pretty good at letting things go. Uh... Are we generous with tolerance? I'm tolerant of other people's behavior. I'm tolerant of other people's faults. Am I generous with love? I'm going to pour on love. That person let me down. Pour on love. That person disappointed me. Pour on love. That person's acting in a way that I don't like. Pour on love. That person's disappointing me once again. Pour on love. Am I generous with love? You know, the idea of grace is we get things we don't deserve. That's good. The idea of mercy is we don't get what we deserve. And that's also really good. Because we have a tendency of saying, well, that person does not deserve my love. Well, that's kind of the point. Christ says, be merciful as I am merciful. Be generous with them when they don't deserve it. Because Jesus says, even unsaved people without the Holy Spirit know how to treat people well who treat them well. This whole Sermon on the Mount is revolutionary. It can change your life and it can change this nation. We would have our jails empty out. We wouldn't have to be spending a fortune on prisons and police and the judicial system if we would all fall in love with the goodness we see in the Sermon on the Mount. It would change everything. Have a lot less divorces. Have a lot less friends who, who just can't stand each other anymore. Amen? Amen? Oh, we can do better than that. This is beautiful. Amen? Amen? Not just thinking about ourselves, but being generous in the way we treat others. Not quick to dismiss. Not quick to criticize. Not looking down on otherwise, otherwise judging people. Dr. Henrietta Myers noted that the entire Sermon on the Mount is basically God's law for his kingdom. Jesus is saying, my people... Here's how I want me, my people to act. And it can be summed up in the thought, be kind to one another. The spin I put it on it, it was more negative. It said, don't be a jerk. The Sermon on the Mount is how not to be a jerk. Be kind to one another. And Henrietta Myers, uh, she notes that if we could all follow the Sermon on the Mount, quote, the world would be set in order. One day filled with kindness would be a bit of heaven. Love would reign instead of lawlessness. Jesus tells us later in Matthew chapter 22 that when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, remember the Pharisees are kind of like the religious conservatives, uh, the Sadducees, I mean this is simplistic, but they're kind of like the religious liberals. The uh, Sadducees were sad because they thought when you died, you stayed dead. That's why they were sad, you see. Uh, they gathered themselves together. One of these, one of the Pharisees, a lawyer, and then yeah, that's when you hear the music, boom, 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 boom. No, sorry. Sorry to all the lawyers. Uh, the lawyer asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Isn't that a good lawyerly question? What's, what's the number one commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the entire law and the prophets. And that's what Jesus is getting across in the Sermon on the Mount. And he tells us in John, the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 15, 
He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you, it's enough to, hallelujah, praise Jesus, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, and then go treat people miserably? Jesus says, if you love me, start doing this thing. He's saying, don't just say you love me. It's got to be more than words. If you really care about me, then follow the good things that I'm teaching you to do. Jesus explains that it's not enough to do the right things. God is concerned with our attitudes and our motives as well. God loves us. That's why he wants our hearts. Not just the external, the inside. He wants our minds 100%. He wants us to live our lives for him because he's living for us. He died for us. Brothers, sisters, friends, God wants your heart. Are you listening? What are you going to say to him today? Yes, God, here I am. You can have everything. Because I make a mess of it when I do things my way. Or you can harden your heart and walk away. Please, don't walk away from love. Don't walk away from this goodness. Jesus went to the cross so that we could have eternal life. That we could have this life where we walk with God in the cool of the day. We share our life together. We share meals together with the Lord. Jesus is Emmanuel. He's God with us in every situation in life. God wants to be with you. God wants every part of you because that's how much he loves you. This morning, brothers and sisters, friends, in your heart, say, Lord God, I'm yours. Lord God, I don't want to run from you. Lord God, this life you're calling me to, it is beautiful. And if I turn my back on goodness, there's only darkness in front of me. And I've been down that path before. It's lonely. I don't want to be there. Today, open your heart and say yes to Jesus. Yes, God, please forgive me. Come into my life. I want to open that door so that we can do life together. Right now, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray this prayer. Now, if you're already a Christian, long-term Christian, I want you to pray along with me that you can recommit your life to Jesus. You can say, yeah, I, I've been off. And, and maybe you're a person who, who's just been off for months or even years. And if you're not sure, am, am I a Christian? Maybe I, I got baptized when I was a kid or... Or I kind of went to Sunday school, or I went to, or I've been sitting at church, but I'm not sure I really have the Holy Spirit. I don't know if I really, if that's true, right now, right now when I pray, I want you to echo these words. I want you to say, yes, God, repeat my prayer in your heart to the Lord, and God will forgive you. God will come into your life, and your life will be changed. Do it. Why wait? There's no reason not to let God come into your life today. Let's pray together right now. Please bow your heads, and we're going to talk to the God of the universe. Let's pray. Dear Holy God, here I am. Father, I confess I messed up in so many ways. I've been hard-hearted. I've been self-righteous. I've been selfish. I've been greedy. I've been really hard on people sometimes, Lord God. Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. I want to live my life for you. I, I want to live my life for love. I want to know about goodness and love. Help me to follow you every day of my life. Help me to put the, the important things first. Help me to put you first, Lord God. And help me to start treating other people the way you want me to, Lord. Lord God, I'm here. Please bless me. Please bless me, God. And please bless every one of my brothers and sisters in this church. You love me, God. You love them and help me to love them too. And thank you, God. I know you answer our prayers. You're answering this prayer today. Amen.
Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.